Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the last IUSB pop-up university of 2021. And we have a, an exciting show for you tonight to think not about the cold and dreary fall, potentially, uh, but to think more about uh, the beauty of the trees we'll be seeing again in the spring with Professor Deb Marr coming to us from biology. Before we get started, I'd like to let, let everybody know that, uh, that uh, Pop-Up University is a co-production of the IU South Bend Community Engagement Office and also the Center for Excellence in Research and Scholarship. If you're interested in having uh, IU expertise uh, help in your, in your organization or other endeavors, uh, please feel free to contact Gail McGuire, Director of Community Engagement, uh, contact information there, or contact me, Josh Wells, uh, Director for the Center of Excellence in Research and Scholarship. Uh, both websites on the screen can be found at academics.iusb.edu. We of course want to thank our sponsors, Indiana Humanities, as well as the, uh, a number of IUSB departments and offices, uh, series and community engagement, of course, but also academic affairs, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and a host of individual departments throughout the university. Thank you to everybody. So tonight, it is a pleasure to introduce to everybody uh, Dr. Deb Marr, Professor of Biology. She, uh, along with teaching in biology, she also works in environmental studies, sustainability studies, and our Master of Liberal Studies program. Dr. Marr's research interests include ecology and evolution of plant diseases in short-lived and long-lived species, plant-insect interactions in urban areas and nature preserves, and restoration ecology. She works both in urban and nature preserves to find insights into how ecological communities work. In the words of Aldo Leopold, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. She wants to, she's going to talk tonight about current research studying old growth, studying old growth forests. Uh, at uh, Bendix Nature Woods Preserve. Uh, they're notable for their size and a terrific fixture of our, of, uh, you know, our regional community and heritage. And with that, I think uh, I will stop my sharing here and turn it over to Deb. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I would like to thank Lang Lab, in particular Stephanie Risk, as well as Josh Wells and Gail McGuire for inviting me to share this work with you. In addition, I would uh, like to thank uh, the naturalists as well as the uh, facilities um, and operations people at St. Joseph County Parks, as well as the Department of Natural Resources, in particular the Division of Nature Preserves. Without the work of these people, this special ecological place that I'm going to talk about today wouldn't exist. Um, and also the DNR provided the permits that allowed me to do this work. So whether you've been to Bendix Woods hundreds of times, or maybe you've never been, I hope that you'll learn something from this presentation that maybe allows you to look for something new the next time you go, or to think about the ecological history of this forest in a different way. So in Northern Indiana, we have a typical pattern of succession where communities change over time if they're not um, disturbed. So moving from, for example, shrubs to a young forest on the order of decades, moving into a mature forest, typically dominated by white oak and hickory, and then moving into a climax forest of beech and sugar maple. And one of the interesting things about these climax forests is that they're expected to remain stable for hundreds of years. Now, experimentally, this is actually a difficult, in terms of thinking about how stable are these forests, how much do they 
remain the same and how much is actually changing within these climax forests is experimentally a difficult question to ask, partly because of the time scale, we're talking hundreds of years, and secondly, there's very few old growth forests left in Indiana. So before European settlement of Indiana, um, the majority of the state was forested. So this is showing a diagram of 1820, all of this green area, majority forest, some wetlands, some dry prairies. As uh, Europeans moved into this area and started clearing the land for agriculture, you can see this huge decrease in forested land. Um, <clears throat> so currently the majority of the state is agriculture. Um, although in the southern part of the state there are forests and over time actually the amount of forests in Indiana have increased. So currently we have more forests today than we did a hundred years ago. But the old growth forests are the areas that have survived this bottleneck here. And in addition in the Michiana region, the remnant forests, so these old growth forests, um, are relatively unique in that our climate is unique. So we're in a snow belt region of the state that supports rich mesic forests that are characterized by sugar maple and American beech. Whereas if you move further west, you get into drier forests that are more oak um, or black oak savanna. So in particular, Bendix Woods, um, what we know about the history of this region, so it's located in the northern part of the state in St. Joseph County. Um, in 1860, we know that it was homesteaded by Jacob and Emily Hooten. And then in 1926, the land was sold to Studebaker Quarter Corporation. Um, and then in 1966, um, about 175 acres of this land was sold to St. Joseph County Parks. And that's when the St. Joseph County Park System was actually formed. Um, and this was one of the first land gifts to the park. In blue, this is showing the 27 acres of the nature preserve. And we know from records of Studebaker that um, that this area was not logged, um, whereas outside of this area there was some logging, there was actually a pine plantation, um, and the land was used in a variety of ways. So I'm going to focus on this 27 acres of this nature preserve, um, and Alton Lindsay in the late 1960s uh, um, surveyed natural areas throughout Indiana. And he documented that Bendix Woods was one of the 17 old growth forests in Indiana at that time. Of those 17 areas, 12 were privately owned. So the Bendix Woods parcel was one of the first um, publicly um, owned areas. And Lindsay did a survey of Bendix Woods in 1969. So this entire region here is the state dedicated nature preserve. Within this red area, this is the area that um, Alton Lindsay actually surveyed. And he documented all of the trees that were present that were larger than 10 centimeters in diameter in the central area of the preserve. In 1980, um, there was a, a large straight line wind storm that affected 25% of the preserve. So 25% of the area uh, was trees were taken down. This prompted Vic Riemenschneider, uh, who is a professor of ecology at IU South Bend, and Thomas Blodgett, who is a park naturalist at, at, in the St. Joseph County Parks, to establish permanent plots. And they completed a survey of the entire Bendix Woods Nature Preserve in 1981. And the way that they did this survey, so this is showing the entire 27 acre preserve. They divided the nature preserve into 50 meter plots. So each one of these red squares represents 50 meters by 50 meters. They drove galvanized steel pipes into the ground to permanently mark these 50 meter plots. And they recorded the trees present that were larger than four centimeters in diameter and were at least four and a half feet tall in height. Within each of these 50 meter plots, 
they further divided these areas into 10 meter by 10 meter uh, quadrats um, and recorded the trees in each of these areas. So in 2021, we repeated this survey of the entire uh, nature preserve. Now, we actually started this project in 2019. So um, my ecology class in 2019 started this survey. Vic Schneider came out, uh, as well as Andy Schnabel, to help with um, finding these original plots, so finding those galvanized steel pipes, and then also helping the students with tree identification. And so we started surveying on the nature preserve at that time. In 2021, the um, ecology class again uh, was working on this project. Um, and then, but my core team in terms of collecting these data are these three people. So Rose and Schaudergi, Marcus Bailey and Brooke Shoup. And so in the summer of 2021, we uh, spent time uh, collecting the majority of this data. And this is really my core uh, tree data collection team. So we took data on 20,785 trees. 95% of this data was taken in 2021. And we collected data on the full 27 acres, about 11.6 hectares. Now, sometimes running these 50 meter transects is not trivial. Uh, so for example, there are trees down in parts of the nature preserve, and this is showing a uh, transect tape going through one of these areas with downed trees. Um, we recorded the species for all trees that were taller than 4.5 feet, and we measured diameter at 4.5 feet in height for trees that were four centimeters or greater in diameter. And so this is showing a sugar maple of probably around 10 to 12 centimeters in diameter. This is a northern red oak, 142.5 centimeters, so over four and a half feet in diameter. So these old growth forests of the original 20 million acres of Indiana forest, um, less than 2,000 acres of old growth forest are intact. So that's less than 0.01%. Um, and in terms of the age of the trees, uh, the best way to age a tree, of course, to get the most accurate data is to actually collect tree ring data. And so this is where you use a boring tool. You actually bore into the wood. You collect a sample of the wood and you count the tree rings. Um, although this is the most accurate way to get the precise age of a tree, um, it does open up the tree. These wounds can open up the tree and make them more susceptible to um, diseases, um, both insect and fungal. Um, and so we do not have tree ring data for Bendix woods. However, one way that you can estimate tree age is by taking that diameter data that we've collected. And um, there's a relationship between the width of the tree and the age of the tree. So for example, if we look at this graph here, as the tree diameter increases, tree age increases. So smaller trees in general have smaller diameters, larger trees have larger diameters, and this is a fairly strong correlation. This has been fairly well studied for a number of the tree species that are present at Bendix Woods. And so these growth factors um, can be used to um, calculate a rough estimate of tree age. Now I should say that for some of these tree species, we actually have growth factor data that's been developed from old growth forests, for example, the Morton Arboretum in Chicago. But for some of the trees, that data is not available. So, <clears throat> so for any particular tree, its actual age might be an underestimate if um, it actually grew slower than expected, or if it had a light gap and grew faster than expected, uh, the actual age of the tree might be an overestimate. But anyway, it gives us an idea of the ages of the trees in this forest. And so from our 2021 data, um, for these uh, tree species shown up here, um, there were 613 trees that were older than 100 years old. 523 of these trees were older than 100 to 200 years old, 
and 89 of these trees were greater than 200 to 300 years old, and one tree was older than 300 years old. To put this in perspective, um, so if you look in a little more detail at sugar maples and beech, which are the most common trees in this particular forest, so the majority of the old uh, of the trees that were older than 100 years old for the sugar maples, um, the majority of them are 100 to 200 years old, and then um, about 11% of them were 200 to 300 years old. In contrast for beech, more like 25% of the old beech trees were 200 to 300 years old, um, and then about 75% of them were 100 to 200 years old. So if we think back in time, where does that put us? Um, and so this firmly puts us in a time when Native Americans were the, uh, lived in this uh, region. Um, and so for example, specifically in the northern part of Indiana, the Miami Indians uh, were the major Great Lakes tribe uh, that lived in this region. And if we put sort of a Indiana history timeline on it, the very oldest tree that we documented dates back to about 1650. And so that's before the French explorers, so Robert LaSalle uh, visited Indiana. Um, it's before, several hundred years before Indiana became a state. Before, in 1925, that's when Studebaker actually purchased the Bendix Woods property and so forth. So these trees have seen a lot, some of these very oldest trees have seen a lot of change um, over this time period. So if we look at what has been relatively constant, um, overall tree species diversity has been relatively constant within this forest. Um, so we documented 24 tree species if we include the understory trees. And in 1829, there was a pre-settlement vegetation that was recorded by surveyors. Uh, they documented within this region of St. Joseph County that it was dominated by beech and sugar maple, about 25% beech, 28% sugar maple, and that basswood elm and white oak were the major associates at that time. One of the things that's definitely changed, although basswood is still a major associate, elm and white oak are no longer, they're present, but no longer major associates uh, within Bendix Woods. Um, if we look at these 24 species in a little bit more detail, so you can um, categorize tree species based on their conservation value. So these conservation values range from 0 to 10. 0 means that it um, has relatively low conservation value in that it can grow in a wide variety of habitats from highly disturbed areas. Um, in contrast, a value of 10 means that it's highly conserved and it has a fairly specific habitat requirements, so unlikely to grow in a disturbed area. So the tree species that have the highest conservation values between 8 and 10 in Bendix Woods are these that are listed here. So for example, pawpaw, the alternate leaf dogwood, American hornbeam, black ash, and blue ash. If we take just a, a look at a few of these tree species, so for example, blue ash and black ash are interesting. Uh, so blue ash is an understory tree, and it has these interesting four-angled, uh, corky, four-angled stems. Um, and blue ash is, uh, we're sort of in the central part of the range of blue ash. So if you look at this distribution map down here, it goes up into Michigan um, and goes down into uh, Missouri and Arkansas. In contrast, black ash is really more of a boreal species. So you can see we're sort of on the southern edge of the range of black ash, and it extends much further up into Ontario and Quebec. And then pawpaws, we're in the northern part of this range. So pawpaws generally have a more southern distribution as shown here. So one of the things that I find interesting about Indiana is that it's really kind of at an ecological crossroads where you can find these a mix of these boreal species, southern species, and then of course for some species we're sort of smack dab in the middle of that geographic range. So for quite a few of the tree species they have uh, moderate conservation values between four and five, 
And so these are examples of those tree species here. One in particular that was sort of a favorite of um, my field crew this summer was the Kentucky coffee tree, so Gymnocladus dioica. And this is an interesting tree. Uh, it has leaves that are up to three feet in size. So this entire area here is one leaf divided into lots of leaflets. So it has these huge leaves. It also has these interesting seed pods that kind of shake and rattle. Um, so this was a, a fun tree to come across. And then the tree species with the lowest conservation values uh, were things like black walnut, choke cherry, American elm, hackberry, and black cherry. Overall, the average conservation value for all of the tree species that we found in Bendix Woods Nature Preserve was 5.3, and remnant landscapes have a mean uh, conservation value of 4.5. So this forest definitely has <clears throat> a relatively high conservation value and suggesting that it is definitely one of these remnant landscapes. One of the things that's interesting about these old growth forests, they look different than um, more recently logged forests in that they're bi-layered. So they have two layers. So you have the canopy trees and then you have this understory. And because this is a mesic forest, remember we're in that snow belt region, it's a lush mesic understory here. And one of the things that's really interesting, although the focus of this talk is not the herbaceous plants of this forest, but they are special. So quite a few of these understory um, plants have very high conservation values. So for example, plantain wood sedge here, and it's not, and then also the, the maple water leaf, which has a conservation value of eight. Um, and you don't just see one of these, um, one example or one individual of this species, but masses of the maple water leaf and clusters of the plantain wood sedge. And so it's just the species diversity at multiple levels is high and it's a very different kind of habitat than most of the forests that you'll see in Indiana. So if we take a look at what has changed, so how stable is this climax forest? Um, so remember we've got um, for the central part of the nature preserve, we have data that Alton Lindsay collected in 1969. Vic Riemenschneider and Thomas Blodgett uh, did a survey of the entire nature preserve um, in 1981. And then we repeated that uh, survey in 2021. So for the central area of the preserve, we can compare these three time periods. And then for the entire nature preserve, we can compare two time periods about 40 years apart. Um, so one of the major things that has changed is tree density. So if you take a look at 1969 and 1982, there was um, approximately 170 trees um, per hectare, whereas in 2021, that was more like 230 trees per hectare. So 24% increase in trees that were 10 centimeters or greater. If we look at the entire nature preserve, between 1982 and 2021, there was a 40% increase in tree density for trees that were four centimeters or greater in diameter. Um, and then this is looking at the most six most common trees, and I rank them in order from which trees were most common in 1969 to 2021. And this is looking at relative density per hectare. And one of the things that you can see is that the relative density of these six most common tree species was fairly similar between 1969 and 1982. But then in 2021, we're seeing some fairly large shifts. So a decrease in the density of beech, an increase in the density of sugar maple, and then decreases in red elm or slippery elm, basswood, hackberry, and tulip tree. If we look at the relative basal area, so this is looking at that diameter data and trying to get a, a sense of, in terms of wood biomass, which trees are contributing the most to the wood biomass in this forest. Um, so again, in 1969 and in 1982, relatively similar in terms of beech creating, uh, contributing the most to wood biomass, um, and then sugar maple, the red elm, basswood, hackberry and so forth, 
um, but we see a shift in 2021 to an increase in sugar maple. So there's been this shift, and in, if we look at the entire nature preserve, there's been a shift towards more sugar maples. Um, <clears throat> so overall, an increase in density, um, but that increase in density has really shifted towards sugar maples. And one of the things that's inter interesting is that when you look at these trees, so they're competing for light gaps. So when you get one of these tree falls, you get this light gap and whatever tree seedlings are there, they can then, they have the light that they need to really grow and become one of those canopy trees. And sugar maple and beech behave differently in, in these light gaps. So sugar maple grows faster uh, than beech. And there was an interesting study at Warren Woods, which is an old growth beech maple forest up in um, southwestern Michigan. And they documented that some of these beech seedlings can hang out in the understory for a hundred years, waiting for that light gap to come and then shoot up to the canopy. In contrast, sugar maples, they grow faster than beech, but they need a light gap within several decades. They cannot hang out uh, for up to a hundred years waiting for that light gap. Um, and so these beech are just amazingly patient. Um, so if we look at what were the most abundant trees, so it's maples and beech, but it's shifted towards a greater abundance of maple trees and a lower abundance of beech. And so in some of these um, quadrats, we found over 150 to 200 sugar maples. So this is just showing one of these really dense uh, sugar maple plots. And actually what we're finding in Bendix Woods is not unique. Um, so I pulled together data from other old growth forests throughout the Midwest and the Northeast. And each of these areas, so for example, Warren Woods, um, there was a 32 year record, Brownsfield Woods over a 50 year record, a um, couple woods in Ohio, Tennessee, and then also in Quebec. And in each of these regions, sugar maple has been increasing over the last several decades. So the pattern that we're seeing of an increase in sugar maple in Bendix Woods is not unique and seems to be occurring in several old growth areas um, throughout the Northeast. However, if we look in this region here, so the Adirondack in southern Quebec area. Um, in these old growth forests that have been studied in this region, there's actually sugar maple decrease. So something different is happening here. Um, not clear what yet. Um, so the other major thing that is changing is age structure. And I'm showing an age structure diagram for beach um, this is looking at the frequency of trees. So for example, in 2021, trees that were four to nine centimeters, um, there were about 60% of the beech trees that we documented were in that size category. And remember, smaller trees are younger, larger trees are older. Um, and so one of the things that you might expect with age structure, so we're comparing 1982 to 2021, the age structure could stay the same. So if all the trees that were four centimeters in diameter in 1982, if they all mature into the next age class 40 years later, um, then you could see similar age structure over time. But you can also get changes in age structure if seed germination rates change over time, or if you get changes in mortality rates for different age classes of trees. And one of the things that I want to point out for beech is that we're seeing a change in age structure over this 40 year time period. So there was an increase in the frequency of trees that were small, so the four centimeter and 10 centimeter um, size classes, and also an increase in the largest beech trees. But notice that we're seeing a decrease, a fairly dramatic decrease in these um, middle size age classes. And if we look at the age structure for sugar maples, so again, blue is showing the 1982 data, red showing the 2021 data, we're seeing a decrease in the um, four centimeter to nine centimeter size category, but an increase in the 10 centimeter to 20 centimeter and so forth. So an increase in sort of the middle size trees. If we look at the next 
five most common trees um, in terms of density. So slippery elm, basswood, and hackberry have been decreasing, whereas tulip poplar and bitternut hickory have been increasing in density. And if we look at their age structures, different things are happening with each tree species. So for example, um, slippery elm or red elm, um, its age structure has remained relatively constant over this 40 year time period. In contrast, um, tulip trees, we're seeing a slight increase in the smallest tree category, so these seedlings, but um, and a fairly large increase in the oldest uh, tulip trees, but a decrease in these middle size age classes here. And so the increase in the youngest age classes suggests that there might be some regeneration potential um, for this tree to increase in frequency over time. In contrast, bitternut hickory, basswood, and hackberry um, are losing the youngest age groups. So this is just showing bitternut hickory here and basswood here. And you can see that there's been a decrease in these youngest age groups, whereas an increase in the older age groups. And that's true for both of all three of these species, actually. And then in some of the trees, they've completely lost their young age groups. So this is looking at the 1982 data. Um, a fair number of northern red oak in these smaller tree diameters, but notice that in our census we really only had the largest trees were present and that these youngest age classes simply were not represented. So what we're seeing is an increase in tree density, changes in the abundance of the tree species, and then also changes in age structure. Now, at the same time, over this 50-year time period, we've also seen changes in the environment. So, for example, <clears throat> um, since 1950, um, so car atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have never been above 300 parts per million, at least over the last, uh, the most recent millennia. And so it's not until after 1950 that you see 300 parts per million or higher of carbon dioxide levels. And so if we take a look at this data from 1960 to, this is to November 16th, 2021, currently on that date, uh, carbon dioxide atmospheric concentration levels were 414 parts per million. So w within this time period, the last 50, 60 years, we've seen a huge increase in carbon dioxide levels of over 100 parts per million. And one of the effects that this has had um, in Indiana is we're expecting to increase storm events by two to three fold increase. Um, and these extreme storm events can affect Bendix Woods in particular um, because when you get these strong wind um, or strong storms, you can get more tree falls. And for example, American Beach is relatively shallow rooted and so it's more likely to be toppled over in one of these uh, wind throws. So this is an example of a wind throw from this summer. So here's a beech sapling and then one of these older trees that's been toppled over by wind. Um, and so as you get more of these wind storms, we might expect more tree falls to occur. So we're gonna get more of these light gaps and more competition between those understory trees competing for the canopy. Now, the other thing, remember that for beach, we had um, fairly high frequency of trees in the smallest um, age categories. But there's two other things that are um, happening that on the horizon that may affect the ability of these saplings um, to persist. So beech bark disease was introduced from Europe. It was actually introduced into Nova Scotia in the late 1700s. And in beech bark disease, you have this beech scale insect that comes in first. So this was introduced um, from Europe. And this beech scale insect feeds on the sugars in the tree. And it looks kind of like white snow on the bark of the tree. Um, the fungus, uh, so after the beech scale insect comes in, then the fungus Neonectria comes in and it starts feeding on that excess sugar that the beech scale insects are accessing. And together, the fungus and the beech scale insect contribute to these cankers. 
that develop on the beech trees. And once you get these cankers, then the, the wood weakens and the trees just snap. And so this is a photograph of woods that have this beech bark disease where the beech trees have just snapped and just fallen, you know, like logs on the forest floor. Um, so this is showing, so the beech scale insect was first detected in 1890 in Nova Scotia and since then has been slowly spl spreading west. Um, you can see that it's not here yet in Indiana. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out is that in um, Nova Scotia, for example, when it came through, caused 85% mortality of the beech trees. In the Catskill Mountains, 61 to 81% mortality of the beech trees. And in 2010, 2015, it's already present in northern Michigan um, and so forth. So this is something to watch for. Um, a more recent disease introduction has been beech leaf disease. This is caused by a nematode, which is a roundworm. And this roundworm uh, was introduced from Asia and it affects the leaves. So it infects the leaves, it causes the leaves to kind of dry up and crinkle. And this has really high mortality rates in the saplings. So the mortality rates have been documented to be up to 90%. It was first introduced into um, Ohio along the shore of Lake Erie in 2012. Since then, it has been spreading outwards. It is not present in Indiana yet. Um, but for example, in 2021, it kind of uh, jumped. Um, and was documented in West Virginia as well as Maine, probably due to the movement of firewood uh, from this region. Um, and so this is another disease that's kind of on a horizon, not here yet, but if it does come into our region, it's gonna affect the survival of those beech saplings. Now, in contrast, I, I, I wanna, so beech, of course, and other trees have natural enemies as well. One that we found this summer that was um, quite fun are these um, woolly beech aphids. And they, um, if I show this video here, so you can see these um, beech woolly aphids. So they are hanging out in high densities on, this, on the branches of beech trees. And when you get close to them, they start wiggling, sort of doing a boogie-woogie dance. Um, they are highly specific. So this is a natural enemy of beech. It is native to um, the American beech. So we were just looking at the nymphs of these woolly beech aphids. They congregate in these high clusters and they, they wave. So uh, as a defense mechanism against uh, predators such as birds. Um, they also feed on the sugary sap of beech and that sugary sap then um, attracts a highly specialized fungus that feeds off of that excess sap that's excreted by the aphids. And in years when you get high levels of these woolly beech aphids, there's a third player that comes into the system so the larvae of this harvester butterfly come in and they consume these beech aphids. Um, and so this is what the mature butterfly looks like and then these are the larvae here. Um, and so we sort of have this um, balance between the woolly beech aphids, the fungus that's highly specialized in um, feeding off the sugars here, but then also this predator that helps keep in check the woolly beech aphid populations. And so the beech seedling mortality from this, um, from the woolly beech aphids is only about 10%, um, so relatively low. So it actually helps kind of the, although beech can be a really good competitor because it's highly shade tolerant, um, it can help keep the beech saplings um, at a lower level and help maintain diversity of trees um, in forest. And so a very different effect from those introduced diseases that were causing 60% or higher mortality of the beech um, saplings. So what we're seeing is um, a shift from a beech maple dominated forest to a maple beech dominated forest. Um, as we get more tree falls and light gaps, that's gonna favor sugar maples as well as tulip poplar. We have these new diseases that are targeting beech and that's something to watch out for. 
Um, and then the last thing to take a look at is competition with understory trees. So the two most common understory trees were pawpaw and spicebush. So first we'll take a look at pawpaw. Um, this was by far the most common understory tree. We documented over 5,000 of them. It was about 27% of actually the total trees that we took data on. And this is um, looking at a, a pawpaw. It's an understory tree. So this is um, a pawpaw tree here. And you can kind of see a little grove of pawpaws here. They can grow in clonally um, and become quite dense. There was a study in Ohio um, that showed that tree seedling establishment was lower under um, the uh, pawpaw trees. And so one of the things that we took a look at, uh, so remember we took data in these 50 meter by 50 meter plots, and then within each plot we have data on 10 meter by 10 meter quadrats. And so we took a look at which quadrats had high density of pawpaws and which quadrats had low density of, of pawpaws. And um, we did this for quadrats present throughout the nature preserve and um, compared what was the um, density of tree seedlings and also in particular maple seedlings that were present in these quadrats with low pawpaw density versus high pawpaw density. Um, Rose is the person who kind of took the lead on this uh, particular part of the project. Um, in general, we saw for total number of seedlings less than four centimeters in diameter, there was um, a trend towards decreased uh, tree seedling density in both total tree seedlings and in maple tree seedlings, although not significantly different um, uh, between these two areas. So a lot of variation between the quadrats. So neutral to negative effect here. Um, the second most common understory tree was spicebush, and this is a beautiful tree. So in the spring, it has these lovely yellow flowers. And so when you walk in Bendix Woods in the spring, you just sort of see lots of yellow in the understory. And then in the fall, it has these really colorful red berries. Um, so spicebush makes up about 9% of the total trees. And uh, Marcus took the lead on analyzing these data. Um, so again, we compared plots with low density versus high density spicebush. Um, and this is uh, data looking at maple seedlings and beech uh, uh, saplings. And you can see that there's a tendency towards in the plots with high density of spicebush, we tend to see more maple seedlings and significantly higher beech saplings. Um, so not a significant difference here for the maple uh, saplings because um, a lot of variation. But in the beech saplings, in the high density quadrats with high density of spice bush, um, higher density of beech saplings. So if we take this all together, how do understory trees further affect the establishment of tree seedlings? For the pawpaws, we're seeing neutral to perhaps negative effects on tree seedlings. In contrast, for spice bush, we're seeing neutral to, in some cases, positive effects um, on tree seedlings, in particular for the beech um, seedlings. So if we look at the predictions for um, climate change in terms of tree habitat suitability by 2100, so looking into the future, um, these tree species for the northern part of Indiana are all expected to decrease. And already we're seeing signs, at least within Bendix Woods, that the American beach uh, probably definitely will be decreasing. Um, in Bendix Woods, we're actually seeing an increase in sugar maple um, throughout northern Indiana, it's expected to ha see uh, no change. And then increases in yellow poplar um, or the tulip poplar um, tree here. And then also as we move closer to 2100, so we're expecting um, new habitat, um, so new tree species to come in um, and get established. And so I just wanted to share with you as in your next walk through Bendix Woods, maybe a few new things to look at. It's an opportunity to walk back in time, to see what an ecosystem looks like
that hasn't been deserved, hasn't been disturbed. Um, and to see some of these sort of a glimpse at how an ecosystem might function um, under these old growth conditions. And both the understory and the canopy is just amazing in this area. So it's an opportunity for time travel. Keep an eye out for those beach diseases. So in particular, that beach scale insect, that's going to kind of look like snow on the uh, beach trees. And then for the beech leaf disease, that's going to look like uh, crinkled leaves there. So keeping an eye out for that. Um, and then finally, this is just one nature preserve of many that are present throughout Indiana. Each one of these nature preserves has a unique ecological history that can't be replaced. Um, and finally, I just want to acknowledge the um, Division of Nature Preserves for providing the permits and allowing us to do this study, St. Joseph County Parks uh, for maintaining this area and allowing us to work in this area. Um, the funding sources that supported um, the students this summer and then finally field assistance. And I want to thank you for joining me this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Are, are folks able to... Are folks able to hear me? No? Oh, great. All right. Wonderful. Um, uh, Dr. Mark, can you hear me? That's I can important. now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I can't hear you now, though. So. Oh, okay. <clears throat> we'll can get you it hear me out. now? Um, we have a lot of questions, um, so and that's great. Um, uh, so uh, we'll see if we can work this out. I, I just want to say thank you to you before we um, get started. And um, I can uh, confidently say I've um, uh, not ever been quite so engaged um, thinking about the uh, ecology of the trees in this area. So I appreciate that quite a bit. Um, we'll start with, uh, we'll just go through these. Um, wondering what the significance of four and a half feet is when deciding which trees to survey. Uh, we measure. I, I'm still having trouble hearing you. You can't hear me. Audio, but I don't know if others are or not. Oh, I, I, so think, we, I think we can all hear me now. Hear. Can you hear me? I I can hear you, Deb. Can you hear me? So. Um, oh wow! Oh wow! We have all sorts of. Jo issues. Josh and and Deb, if you're able to hear each other, maybe Josh, so, you should take over uh, the Q and A. We measured all of the um all of the trees so we measured every tree that was one point so 4.5 feet in height or taller and we measured the diameter for all trees that were of that height at least that height and four centimeters or greater in diameter um so uh, and then i took all of that data i selected the in order to do the tree estimates of tree age, I looked at the largest trees um, to get an estimate of how are how old are the trees that we're looking at there. So I don't Thanks. know if that answers your question. No, we'll yeah, chat uh, if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I'm back on now, by the way. So. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that, that, I thought it was a, a nice answer. Stephanie, could you hear Deb now? Uh, I can now. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. Sorry. Good. I think good. it was a technical uh, issue on my end. Yeah. There, there was can you can you can you hear me if I talk now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Then I'll disappear. Okay. Uh, next question is um, whether any of these species would be considered in invasive, um, or if there's a threat of invasive uh, trees taking yeah. over these old growth. One nice. of the things I was so concerned about this, because, of course, we have Norway maples that are in this region. We also have uh, potentially white mulberry uh, trees that could be coming in. Um, we did not see uh, invasive trees in Bendix Woods this summer. Um, so at least so far, uh, the, all the trees that I listed there, they are all native trees. So, it, yeah, it was a very happy occasion. 
great. Um, well, other than um, a, a lot of um, positive feedback um, here, there's uh, thank you so much for um, for echoing what I, what I feel. It's just great. Um, next uh, question um, is what we can do. Um, those of us who are have listened to this or are listening to it in the future, what can we do to support the Bendix Woods? Um, ecology. Yeah. So one of the things uh, that I have a concern about, so there's a fence that goes around the, the nature preserve. There's not much buffer on the other side. So on, so just outside, there's all sorts of things that are happening from, you know, cornfields to um, roads and movement of trucks and so forth through. So if we could create a, a larger buffer to decrease the edge effects, that would help protect the nature preserve from invasive species getting in. Um, so that would be helpful. The other thing is supporting the division of nature preserves. So these little pockets, we actually have a brand new nature preserve that uh, so Lydic Bog, you might be familiar with that just got dedicated in 2019. That's in St. Joseph County. And so the more that we can preserve some of these unique ecological pockets, um, that would help preserve some of our ecological history. So yeah, supporting our, our naturalists, supporting our parks, um, and uh, and then creating buffers around them so we protect them from getting those invasive species. Thanks. Um, the next question, uh, I know you were, I remember you saying towards the beginning that um, you had documentation that the that area was um, not was untouched or was not logged. Um, but uh, the question I, I maybe is um, whether there's any, I guess, how, how do you establish that? Like, what, what is the evidence? The question is whether there's any evidence to indicate maybe there was selective logging at some point yeah. or, or anything. How, how do you know that it's been untouched since the 1920s? So uh, that's from the records of Studebaker. So Studebaker actually, he actually put in a pine plantation just to the north. Uh, so if you actually walk through, if I share my screen, um, let me see if I can share a map uh, that, oops, let me get back to um, the beginning here. Um, All right, so I'm going to share this map. Um, so we know from the records of uh, Studebaker that um, this region here was not logged since uh, 1922. And then um, there is some evidence. So if you actually go over here, uh, so I was talking with Vic Riemann Schneider, there's some evidence of um, some probably agriculture, so some farming over here. And actually, when you get into this region, we do see in the understory, there is actually some multiflora rose and also barberry. Uh, so there's a little bit more invasive understory in this region here. So this is a lower lying area that's wetter. There might have been some, a little bit of farming here. Uh, and then also there's evidence that as you move over into this region, there was selective logging over here. And then of course, if you move north on Raccoon Run Trail, then you get into that beach, uh, uh, sorry, pine plantation area that was actively pine plantation. So this documentation here is mostly from Studebaker records. And he actually actively preserve this area, no logging, had it kind of off limits um, mm. for that time period. Great. Um, so uh, next question is whether your research includes um, an interest in um, the tree species that might have been particularly valuable to the indigenous groups. You mentioned them, I think the Miami Indians and and how um, I'm looking back at my notes here um, that, you know, they coexisted with some of these um, older trees that may have been uh, even hundreds of years old. Uh, yeah, when, uh, LaSalle came through. Um, do we know anything about how um, the the trees, how they interacted with the tree species? at that time? Um, 
I, I don't know. Uh, I would love to team up with somebody who knows sort of the history of the Miami Indians and how they were using um, tree species in that region. There is some, uh, so some of the things that I, I am aware of, of course, they were using, um, for example, some of those seed pods from the Kentucky to coffee tree. Uh, some of the Native American groups would roast them um, in a drink. Uh, certainly, they would have been using some of the wood for different, um, a variety of uses. Um, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would love to team up with somebody who knows more about the history, maybe of what the Miami Indian Native Americans were doing in this region at that time, and see if we could piece together. There's a that similar question about um, interaction with animal species and, and um, how they have maybe um, what that interplay might have been over time, and how it maybe has changed over time or not. Yeah, actually, one really cool thing. So uh, bison are pretty much exterminated from Indiana. Uh, but if you go back even just 100 years to so to 200 years to the early 1800s, bison would have been part of this landscape. And certainly there's no bison here now. Um, so how that would have changed, I don't know how much they would have been hanging out um, in the forest there, but certainly their grazing habits might be might have affected the understory there. So I, I don't know. Uh, so certainly bison would have been here, how they would have changed that understory, I don't know. The other sort of big change, of course, white deer uh, has increased quite a bit in frequency and that also affects the understory. And actually the uh, park just had um, some hunts, uh, I believe maybe a week or two ago to try and lower the deer population because that can have a big impact on both the tree seedlings that can grow as well as the understory. Um, so in terms of mammals, that would be a big change. Um, and then I would love to team up with an ornithologist. There's lots of woodpeckers out there. There's owl, uh, so barred owl is quite commonly heard out there. Um, but in terms of how those bird species might have changed over time, I'd need to team up with somebody about that. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question um, or, or maybe a comment and then a question um, saying that um, uh, Steve Sass remembers that uh, Vic documented some butternut, Juglian centera, um, yeah. and whether that's been recorded in the past, if there are any still there, and um, also a same question for um, Olmus Tomasi. Uh, so, yeah, so we definitely did not see any, uh, either of those species this summer. Um, the Juglin Cinericea uh, was in sort of the northern part of the nature preserve in Vic's original survey, and there weren't very many trees. Um, and so we did not document it this summer. Um, for the elm species, uh, so there was red elm and um, American elm that we documented, uh, but none of the Tomasii. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of combine these two. Um, uh, if there's any invasive sugar maple or tulip poplar diseases or pests that we should uh, be watching for, you talked a lot about the beech trees, um, and it just seems, you know, like there's uh, kind of a invasive issue with with a number of trees, and in, including the emerald borer for the ash trees, and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, I'm not aware of any. Uh introduced diseases for sugar maple and tulip poplar yet. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Um, but at least the current moment, the major concern is about those two new beach diseases that could potentially move into this area. Uh, quick question, did the pawpaw produce much fruit? No. Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, we, we uh, measured over 5,600 pawpaw trees and not a single fruit on them. They do flower, but they're mostly growing clonally. And I think because of the shade, it's a very high shade. So beech maple forest tends to have dense shade. So they are not producing much fruit at all. Yeah. Um, well, uh, maybe make this the last question of the night. Um, awesome students. 
uh, like the student um, research and involvement here is is um, incredible. Um, Brenda Phillips uh, has noted that they've made, also made their own presentations about yes. a month ago, um, which were great. Um, can you leave us with a little bit of um, your perspective on research immersion and that experience and and sort of how that impacts the students from your perspective, at least? I think research opportunities, particularly if students can get involved uh, early on in their undergraduate career, can make all the difference in the world. In my own life, um, so I, I wasn't able to get involved in research until I think my junior year, um, but it just opened up a whole new world of possibilities and it opened up possible career and there's so many career options. But the thing with the, the research is that you get a chance to work on a project and really sink your teeth into it. And you're not tied to, okay, this report is due in the next couple of weeks and that kind of thing. And so you can sink your teeth into more deeply into a question and a project. And the students get to see, um, especially if they start early, they can start one area and they're like, I really hate field work. Uh, you know, there's bugs and there's uh, heat and there's rain and there's trees falling. Um, um, or they love it and then can go on in that area. So I think in terms of exploring possible careers, um, it, it's a highly valuable experience. So. Yeah, um, I'll just say um, I was I had the opportunity to to do some student research my junior and senior years in the sociology department at IUSB and um, it absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. So, um, I, you know, a uh, hundred thumbs up for that. And I will turn it back over to uh, Josh to close us out for the evening. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, that, that was amazing. I think I, I could have asked about a hundred more questions, but I'll just catch you tomorrow. Sure. <laughs> Sounds excellent. That'd be, um, I, I just want to remind everybody: you will, you can find Professor Mars' video uh, within a few, within a few days at the website on your screen, uh, iusb.edu/community-engagement, or just Google IUSB pop up, and you'll be able to uh, find it very, find it very easily. You can find uh, YouTube videos for a year and a half now, uh, and watch for our upcoming events. We will be starting up again in February. Uh, if you're not on our email list, you can also find a link there to sign up for it. And thank you all for being here. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful year at Pop-Up University, and uh, we're, we're grateful for our audience, and we're especially grateful for uh, Professor Mars' terrific talk tonight. Thank you so much, Deb, and uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>